so I wanted to start this by going straight into a question I was asked on the, on the YouTube channel recently, which was, what is my opinion on 9-11? But I'm going to start by saying, again, I'm very grateful I get to do this. I haven't done this. I'm late, right? I'm supposed to do this for the previous week. It's the middle of this week currently. I'm doing it for the previous week, so I'm very late. And when I'm late, it feels like I haven't done it in a long time when I go back to doing this. And so I get to experience how grateful I am, again, that I, I can do this. So thank you if you're watching and thank you, period. So 9-11. Uh, a comment asked me recently what I think about 9-11. And I was hesitant to do research before recording this. When I was 16, around that age, I became obsessed with conspiracies. I think many people, especially men, have that phase at some point. Unfortunately, for example, my family and people I know, they've f either they've fallen... Well, a lot of people fall into that phase and never get out. They just keep digging deeper into the rabbit hole. And a lot of people fall into it late, later in their, in their later, in their later, in their later years. And same, they get trapped in it and they never get out. I remember just, yeah, falling into the rabbit hole, digging myself deeper and deeper until I got to some videos on YouTube that were extremely fast and just so much information just ridiculous and it's interesting how it is a rabbit hole you start with 9-11 was fake which seems quite easy to believe and you end up with these cold-blooded lizard shape-shifting lizards and all kinds of things you know who knows maybe it's true but 9-11 now the point i was making when i talked about it previously was that some people refuse to even consider, they refuse to think about it as if it's possible that these quote-unquote conspiracies could be true, you know. And I think that's ridiculous. But 9-11, so I decided on purpose not to do, not really to go back and do research. When I was 16 and I was obsessed with these things, I did plenty of research and made my opinion. But eventually I came to the, I came to the conclusion that it's quite pointless. You know, the idea is that I think logically, if you're, in my opinion, if you're relatively smart, you understand that media, the news is just a propaganda machine and that its goal is not to inform you, the average person about the world. That's not the point. The point is to drive home an agenda. Now that sounds very conspiracy theorist, you know. When you say that people, some people might, might think, oh, okay, this guy's crazy. I think the opposite for sure. If you think that the media and that the news exist to inform you about what's happening around the world, I think you're pretty dumb. And many things that, or things that were called conspiracies turned out to be true. And it just makes sense. Okay, we'll just go into 9-11. So what I remember, actually I asked, I have this, I think, chat GPT on my phone, and I asked it for, in total, 15 reasons why people think the 9-11 terrorist attacks were faked. And chat GPT had no trouble finding me 15 reasons. And every, every reason it gave, it finished by saying, but of course, or by saying, you know, but that's just a coincidence, or, or that was dis disproven by this or by that. And wh when there is smoke, there is fire, as we say, right? And there's a lot of smoke around the 9-11 terrorist attacks. So things that I remember, and I, I will admit it here that I haven't done research and I can't say for sure that they were faked, but where, where there is smoke, there is fire. And so based on the information, it's highly suspicious. You look at what happened afterwards and how it affected the world, this terrorist attack, how it affected the world. A lot of people talk about control. They talk about COVID in that way as well. And how 
these catastrophes happen and they give the government extra power and extra control. You know, oh, we're in danger now, so we need to, to protect you, we need to have more control over you. I suppose with responsibility comes authority. And the more vulnerable we are, the more, you know, they're responsible and therefore the more authority they give themselves. And we accept it because we feel vulnerable. And so, so you look at the repercussions of 9-11, things that the US government allowed itself to do as a result of 9-11. And it seems, you know, highly convenient in many ways what happened. And then you look at the actual attacks. And so I'm going to try to remember. There was a passport. The, a passport of one of the terrorists was found. I think my brother... I talked about it with my brother and my mother's husband or also a few days ago. And they're both, you know, they both think it's a... Consp they both think it's fake. But my brother said... I remember there was a passport thing. My brother said they found it apparently on a taxi. There was the passport. There was the fact that the way the towers collapsed was weird you know they got hit really high but then they crumbled as if some people say there might have been explosives at the bottom there was a lot of money that was moved my brother also said apparently there was gold in the towers that was moved before once again i'm not certain of all this but apparently there was large sums of money which were moved the day before people also were not present in the building a lot of people who should have been for suspicious reasons. There's the one that supposedly crashed in the Pentagon, but then there was very little damage. And that was mostly ignored and hidden. Um, no arms. There were lots of suspicious things around this attack. Once again, where, where there's smoke, there's fire. And so, unless you're the type of person who thinks well, the government is benevolent. They wouldn't ever do anything. It's not even about benevolence because at the end of the day, I don't even know if I believe that the fact that the government has more control, control is necessarily bad. But to me, based on all the information around this situation, I side with the idea that it was done on purpose, for a reason, and blah, blah, blah. I don't buy into the idea that terrorists, kind of independent terrorists, attacked the US. And the US, you know, was caught off guard. So that's my stance. I don't believe. I believe it was an inside job. There you go. I believe, you know, I don't know. I believe. And I don't just believe based on the information. You know, it's stuff I've seen on YouTube and on the internet. You know, how am I supposed to base my opinion solely on that. So the information itself, which is suspicious, was gathered through the internet. I'm not a detective, so I can't just base my opinion on that. But then there's the repercussions, which suggest that the attack had an effect that gave the US permission to do certain things. So the repercussions of the attack are also suspicious. And, and the fact that, as a lot, a lot of people believe, they repeated their MO with, uh, with COVID. They repeated their MO with COVID, giving us a new catastrophe, and then assert more control as a result. And it's done all the time. I think when the billionaires died in the submarine, everyone was talking about it all the time. And then I remember someone told me, oh, but no one's talking about what's happening in Ukraine, I think it was. And I'm not someone who follows the news. I heard about the submarine at work at some point, and then everyone was talking about it all the time, and I thought, shut the fuck up, I don't give a shit. You tell me once, maybe, okay, some billionaires are lost in the sea, they were trying to visit the, the Titanic with this new revolutionary submarine, okay, Okay, that's sad and that's interesting. But for a week, talking, talking about it for a week, who, who, who gives a shit? And so it made me think, you know, why are people talking about it so much? It's because the news is feeding it 
feeding them this information 24 7 so they're thinking you know it's taking so much space in their head and no one is talking about other things so it's just the way the news works it gives you a distraction it's a it's a weapon of mass distraction the news and so same thing with covid now there's aliens apparently you know what what are they trying to hide this time so yeah i'm, I'm suspicious and I prefer to question things. And I definitely don't look at the, at the news as this thing that's trying to make me smarter. I don't think that's the point of it. And I think it's quite illogical to think it is. Alright, I think I have a lot of notes today. My laptop is there solely to light me. On my phone now. We'll go for... One note I've written is, I am a big enjoyer of walking as a means of transportation. Great. That won't take us anywhere. So. Mm, my brother is listening to an interview of Sean Strickland next door. And it's fucking loud. So I'm distracted. On time is late. I like this quote, on time is late. I'm always, I, I always try to be early. Almost always. And recently I've been very sloppy with my routine, with all my habits. I've kind of dropped my good habits, including being early. I, la I leave to go to work half an hour early. And I usually get there about 20, sometimes I walk around and get there at 15 20 minutes early and one thing I, some, something people love to say is that when you're late that's when the obstacles start piling up you're on the bus you're late oh now there's a person in the wheelchair trying to get in it's taking longer there's a traffic jam there's an accident on the road when you're late the obstacles pile up right and of course it's just a it's just our perception who makes us believe that it's not true but when you're early, usually no one, no one feels that way. No one says when you're early, that's when, you know, things happen to try and make you late. No, it's when you're late that, or when you're, when you're planning to arrive just on time, that's when problems happen and suddenly you're late. And that's why on time is late because there's no such thing as on time anyways. If there's no such thing as on time, if you want to arrive exactly on time, you have to leave early so that it might happen once, you know, but if you want to arrive just on time, usually, for example, if I want to arrive at work just on time, I'll leave early and then I'll get off the bus a few stops early and walk and boom, I arrive exactly on time. The point is, you can't be on time. If you're planning to arrive on time, you arrive late. On time is early. And last week, I had no money on my bank account, so I needed to put money on my Monzo card, put cash at a pay point in a corner store. And I left very early because I thought, I've never used my Monzo cards. Last time I tried to use it, it didn't work for some reason. So I thought, okay, I need to put all the chips, you know, on my side. Be careful. I'll leave very early. I'll go to the shop. If something happens, I'll, you know, I'll figure it out. I, I left so early, I could have walked to work if it didn't work. And that was part of the reason why I left so early since I've been working there for two years is that if there's a problem anywhere, I leave so early that I can actually walk to work. It's just about an hour or something walk. So I leave early enough that if there's a problem, if there's a problem with the buses, I can take the tube in Brixton. So I can walk to Brixton and take the tube or I can just walk all the way. I can't be late the way I've planned this. And I only started to appreciate that when I started leaving with the goal of arriving just on time. It's just stressful. It is just stressful. So with the... With the cards, I went to the store, to the shop, and it went smooth as butter. The card worked, everything happened perfectly. And it was a Saturday. For the whole week, there had been traffic jams because the buses are on diversion. They're all going through our tiny street. And I don't know why else, but there were traffic jams. Um, there was a flooding in Brixton Hill, I think. Anyways, it took me an hour and a half to get to work every day because of the traffic jams. But I had forgotten that it was Saturday. So I thought, you know, I left very early, I thought, 
There might be a problem with the card, and then there might be traffic jams. The bus might be too packed, I might have to wait for the next bus. So I thought I'm going to leave very early. The Monzo car thing went smooth. And then I got to the bus stop and realized it's Saturday, there's no traffic. Or there's hardly any traffic. And the point I'm trying to make is that when you plan in advance, for example, arriving early, it's the opposite as when you're late. When you're early, it seems like all the obstacles remove themselves. That was the, that's what I thought of when I was on the bus and the Monza car thing had worked and the bus was, you know, chugging along, smooth as butter, no traffic. I thought when you put yourself in a situation where you have to hurry and you're late, that's when things start to pile up. And when you do the opposite, somehow everything gets out of your way. And that links to another point I wanted to make. On time is late. Is that actually I talked with my, I asked this question to my girlfriend three days ago. It was interesting. I, I asked her first what she thinks a man should be. And that's something people talk about a lot. I had thought about bringing the subject up in a few episodes earlier, weeks, months ago. I never did. And my first thought at the time was, I know what a man should be. And then, you know, I didn't do the, I didn't talk about it in the episode. Then I thought about it some more and I realized, actually, I don't. There's no such thing as what a man should be. We know that nowadays. But there is a series of criteria for what I think I should be as a a man and what I think most men fall into in terms of what a man should be. There are people who are different. But one of those... So I brought that up to my girlfriend, who's a woman, and I asked her also what she thinks a woman should be. And she told me she had never thought about it, which I thought was very intriguing because me, as a man or just as me, it's something I've always had in my mind, what I should be as a man, what it means to be a man. And so she thought about it. She gave me her answers. And I I believe one of the earliest, one of the first answers she gave was uh, strong. And she gave me nurturing as well and caring. And nowadays with red pill and all all this, this manosphere thing, A lot of people talk about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman as if there's no intersection, as if they're opposites. And I don't believe in that one bit. The first answer she gave me was strong. I believe people should aim to be strong. And that's that's a point Jordan Peterson makes. There's a difference between being weak and unable to do anything unable to hurt people, there's a difference between that and being someone of good morals. In order to, if you're someone who's capable of hurting people, someone with power, but you don't and you act in a rightful way, that's being a, not what's the word, he uses a word, I don't know, that's being a benevolent person. If you're someone who's weak, who's unable to hurt people and who's una- who has no power and no effect on the world, and you don't do negative things to affect the world, that doesn't mean you're strong. And what he talks about, I think Jordan Peterson, that's the thing he mentions about strength. You want to be strong so that you have a choice, so that you can decide to do do the right thing. You're not forced into doing the right thing, not forced into not doing the wrong thing or not hurting people. You're strong so you don't do things you shouldn't. So her first answer was strong. And I agree with her. But it's just, as, as a person, you want to be strong. And there's many ways to define strong. Strong physically, if you take care of your body. There's so many things that go into it. But these are things that a lot, people neglect nowadays. And I've, I neglect as well. I haven't worked out in two months, almost. I haven't taken care of my diet in almost two months. It's very embarrassing to talk about. But the way my finances work I have this very small window I work very few hours 
I live with my mother and my sister and my brother. And the result, the, the whole point of that is I don't make much money, but I don't have to spend much money. That means that I make just enough money to pay for my, to contribute to the bills and the rent and the food, to pay for my transport, to go to work, and to pay for my food, and to have a little bit left over if I want to go out, for example, once or twice, once a week. And so I, of course, the bills and the rent are priority. These are paid. Every time I get paid from work, I pay these first. But then there's a very, there's a very small amount left that I usually spend on food because I believe that I have a very specific diet and I believe that it's very important. I will pay for food before I will pay for going to the cinema or going out. But recently, because I've become addicted to vapes, that very, well, that, that amount of money that was supposed to be just for my food, as crazy as that sound, I, I've been spending it on these pieces of shit that destroy my health and make me look like a cunt. That's what I've been doing. So I haven't been eating my normal diet. I eat, well, I'm very lucky that we get fed at work. So I eat that food, but it doesn't make me feel good at all. On the contrary, I mean, it fills my stomach up, but it doesn't make me feel good. And I spend, you know, two or three pounds here and there on garbage fast food, on, on chocolate bars and things like that. So as I just said, I'll just repeat it. I've been neglecting my health in terms of my diet because I've been spending my money on vapes. As pathetic and ridiculous as that sounds. Let that sink, let that sink in. So what I was talking about, my God, what it means to be a man. So my definition in terms of what I should be as a man is obviously strong. Also, she used the word nurturing, which people in Manosphere and, for example, Sneeko, Sneeko, I watch a lot of his content, and he wants a woman who's submissive and, I don't remember the words, he, he loves to use the word submissive and probably nurturing and such stuff. But the people in Manosphere love to say that women should be, well, submissive and also nurturing. You know, you go home and your woman's cooked your meal and she's there for you, blah, 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 blah. And a man should be nurturing as well. A man should be nurturing. That's something that they never talk about, but I mean, I don't know. It's, it's really crazy how the views that are purported nowadays, but I mean, on the other hand, you have people who, who act like a woman is just the same as a man, but just she's got boobs and no dick. She's got a vagina instead. I don't believe that's the case either. But there's a lot, there's a, there's, there are, there are a lot of intersections in terms of what either should be. But going back to what I think I should be as a man, and it's not really, obviously I don't know how I would feel if I were born a woman. But there's a part of me that just feels like that's just me, how I view myself and what I aspire to be. And maybe it doesn't even have to be associated with manhood manhood but to a degree I mean it is linked to it but strong going back to the on time is late points I do believe that as a man I need to be strong in many ways but definitely physically and all my life I've been obsessed with fighting the ability to fight now I love watching fights I've always loved it I do think that men have an intrinsic appreciation most men for violence and i'm no different i'm saying most men you know not everyone some people don't like it but i think that most men have this appreciation for violence and the men i know and that i spend the most time with in my life are probably my brother and my father the ones i know the best and we love violence i mean i can't it's just a fact i remember as a kid i used to my mother used to I did have morbid ideas and things that I was interested in, watching manga or anime, as English-speaking people like to say. And there's a lot of fucked up stuff in that. That probably affected me. But I love violence. I love watching fights. 
at, at school I used to fight a lot. I just love it. And <laughs> I remember talking with my brother about it, just how much we love violence. We love seeing a person's head explode in a movie. It doesn't mean that I would enjoy it in real life. But in the movie, we love violence. And my dad, every time we talk to him every week, we video call him. And he tells us about the last show he's watched on Netflix. Usually a Korean show or a, a, a European show. And he's just talking about how oh, he loves Mexic uh, stories about Mexico. And uh, gangs in Mexico. And how they enact vengeance. And how violent and crazy it is. He loves that shit. And we do too. I remember, I remember my mother used to... Tell us, oh, your uncle is fucked up. He made you watch Bruce Lee movies when you were five or six and they're so violent. So it's just a thing that most men have that we do have this passion for violence. And so as a result, I used to fight a lot as a kid. And I've always wanted to be able to fight. When I was in, I guess, primary school, so I used to fight a lot. And one of the school, not a teacher, it's weird, actually, when you think about it. The people who watch you when you're in the playground, that's their job. They're not teachers. That's strange. His name was Bruno. And he saw me fight, and he lit he went to my mother and told her, your son is really good at fighting. He has potential. He should come to my, I guess you would call it the dojo. Not really dojo, just a training gym for Viet Vo Dao, which is a Vietnamese martial art, I believe. So I thought that was my, you know, my superheroes arc starting. The guy sees me in the playground fighting is like, this guy knows, this guy has potential. And so I did that for a year, a year or two. My parents couldn't keep, it was too expensive. And I never really went back to it, but I've always wanted to. And so that's one thing I believe. I would say as a man that you need to be able to fight. And... Go back to Andrew Tate, who always makes the same example. You walk in with your girlfriend, you need to be able to protect her. And a lot of people act like it's an extreme idea. And I think it's pretty self-evident that it's the same point as on time is late. If you're someone who doesn't know how to fight and you find yourself in a situation where you need to defend yourself, if you're unprepared, you'll feel very uncomfortable. If you're prepared, you know, if you're early instead of on time, I, I believe that that reduces the chances of something going bad. And I've been, what's the word, exposed to violence, and I've been in violent situations. And I know for certain that if I had you know, continued Viet Vo Dao and just martial arts in general, I would have felt a lot more comfortable in those situations. And so, and recently also, Bradley Martin has been talking about how because of his size, he could beat, you know, professional fighters who are at lower weight classes. And he had a spa with Sneeko where he destroyed him. And... And at the same time I saw that, I saw a video of John Zerka, who's no, another crazy influencer who's entertaining, fighting a guy called Prime. And John Zerka, it's the same, it's a similar size difference to what you find with Sneaker and Martin and, and what's his name, Bradley Martin, except Bradley is really bigger. But I think John Zerka is taller and he looks much bigger than the other guy. And they start fighting and he looks so pathetic. He looks... It's, he looks pathetic. And the idea as a man of not being, a, not knowing how to fight to me is scary. And it might sound like some kind of macho thing. To me, the idea of finding myself in an, in, not an interaction. What's the fucking word? It's a word that's similar. Oh. Well, thank God I've got a laptop back. It sounds like interaction. It, it sounds similar to interaction, but it's not interaction. Also, I mean, you can't see me right now. Altercation. Altercation, that's the word. Altercation. Yeah, you find yourself in an altercation of any kind, maybe even a friendly spa with, a, with another guy, and you look 
the way John Zerker looked, to me, that's beyond humiliating. doesn't matter if you get beat up. But the idea, as a man, of not knowing how to hold your body, how to move, just... I would hate to be in that situation. So I really need to go to... I've been planning on doing that, to sign up to boxing gym. And there's also the fact that I've played basketball most of my life as a kid, and I really enjoyed it. But as much as I enjoyed it, I always felt like it wasn't really the sport for me. And whereas boxing, it's not a question of like a profession. It's not a question of doing it professionally. It's a question of well, I believe that sports are important for your health and physic, physical and mental. And to me, fighting is like dancing. That's what I, I appreciate it in a similar way. Dancing is a physical expression of music. It's visual music. A person dancing is like, is like music. It's beautiful. And box and fighting is similar to dancing. Not, it's not to a song. But in order to be a good fighter, you have to be in tune with your body, the way you move. Right? When you look at someone who doesn't know how to fight, they look pathetic and ridiculous. Just like if you look at a person who doesn't know how to dance. But then when you look at someone who does know how to dance, right, it's majestic, it's beautiful. And I feel the same about someone who knows how to fight. To throw a punch, to just the way they move, it's beautiful, I think. So there's that. The idea of moving in that way and learning to move that way, you know, to me that's beautiful. I remember, for example, Vier Vodao, we have to, we had to learn like sequences, which were much more similar to dancing, actually, because these martial arts, for the most part, are quite useless in, in an actual fight. That's been proven by the, the UFC, that if you want to win a fight, karate, also, although you have, you know, Stephen Thompson, but for the most part, one, you need to have a complete kind of fighting style, ground game, etc. But also, more simple things work better than all this fancy stuff. But we had to learn the, the these series of moves of, you know, protecting yourself this way, that way, and do, doing it like a dance routine. And I really enjoyed just the movement. So there's that too. I enjoyed the idea of learning to move, learning to be more in tune of my body, and learning to move in that way. Like the, the feeling of throwing a, um, like a body shot or a hook, it feels so good. I, I remember talking about cutting down a tree with a chainsaw a few weeks ago with Uncle Ben and how that feels good to be cutting down a tree and holding that thing and, and slicing through. Or when I did the VR for the first time and just the feeling of, of holding a gun and, and, you know, and aiming and shooting, it just feels so good. And a, with boxing, it's the same. Since I've had my punching bag, all day I'm thinking about, I'm imagining myself just throwing a body shot. It just feels so good, the, the movement. It, to me, the, the, I appreciate the simple fact of moving in that way. But so going back to the more basic idea I was going on about what a man should be. So I believe that knowing how to fight is important. It's the same principle as on time is late. You want to be prepared. To me, that adds confidence to yourself. That feels good. So I do believe a man, for the most part, should be able to should know how to fight. And, for example, one way in which men and women are different... I don't really know how to express this, but... Well, I mean, if I'm walking with my girlfriend and we get attacked, you know, I'll go back to the Tate example. I don't expect her to protect me. Mother Nature doesn't expect her to protect me because the way a, a woman's body is made, they are not made for fighting as much as men are. You know, you can watch the UFC and the women are, are great at fighting, but they'll never be as good as a man because of the physical strength we possess. So, once again, it has nothing to do with sexism or anything, any of that bullshit. It's just the way things are. Which is why I believe that a man should know how to fight because if you're a heterosexual man and you have a girlfriend and that's it, God forbid you find yourself in that situation, you, it is your responsibility. Also, last episode got cut short because, so, the mic stopped working, but I didn't notice. But then the camera stopped working. And I noticed that, which is why the audio is bad, because most of the episode was recorded, the sound uh, was recorded on the camera. But I was talking about Andrew Tate and his disdain for women, which is something, you know, I don't like. 
Fuck, where was I going? Oh my god, my, my whole body is sore. It's sore from not working out. How sad. Fuck, where was I going with this? Yes, and so this idea of his disdain for women, where he definitely feels and says sometimes that men are superior. He does believe that. And you can't actually calculate. I don't think you can calculate that. Because, you know, a woman who's very good at fighting against a man who doesn't know how to fight, if the sizes are favor the woman, even if the, the woman's bigger than the man and she really knows how to fight, she'll kick the man's ass. Right? So, women can compete with men in almost all areas. I mean, in many areas, they can, of course, they're better. And in some areas, they can compete with us. But for example, a woman can bear a child which is something we can't compete with, it's something we're incapable of. And so as I said, you can't calculate, as stupid as that sounds, some people do want to make that that case, that men, in, at the end of the day, men are better than women. Some people actually believe that. You can't, so you cannot calculate that. You cannot come to that conclusion kind of scientifically. But there's nothing a man can do that a woman can't do well I mean a man of obviously we carry the sperm but you know people will say for example where are the feminists when men are getting blown up at war or when every building that's been built the people wearing the hard hats and the orange jackets are men you know there are things that you know m women are not predisposed to do as much as men and willing to do as much as men. But a woman could do that. You know, if she, and once again, physically less strong, not made for manual labor as much as men, but a woman could do it. Maybe less good than a man who's doing the same job in terms of being on the building site, but a woman could do it. When it comes to carrying and growing a new life form in one's body for nine months, and then giving birth to said life form and bring a new, bringing a new human being into the world, which is a miracle. I know it sounds very, once again, hippie-ish. Oh, giving life is a miracle because I guess hundreds of thousands of people are born and die every day. But it is a miracle. And that's something men can't compete with. It's not, you know, it's just not part of our, our experience as a man. All this to say that just this idea of Trying to compare one is better than, than the other is just ridiculous. And yeah, there you go. So one, this idea of comparing them, the two sexes is ridiculous. And two, the idea that the two sexes are opposites is also ridiculous. There we go. There you go. I made my point. And so my definition of what a man should be there was this idea of a man should be able to fight. Now, that's one thing that not all men agree with, and it's something that I see as a thing I need to be able to do. One, because I have a passion for it, and two, because I believe it is a necessity for my well-being that my my girlfriend is very pretty. And I remember walking around Brixton with her on a Saturday night. Didn't really think things through. And people were looking at her like she was a piece of meat. You know, people are drunk. It was around midnight. or No, it was 11 p.m. People are partying. They're drunk. And men were looking at her like she was a piece of meat. And I understand from their perspective, especially, you know, they're drunk. But... It's just a fact of life. And being in my situation, for example, my girlfriend is very attractive. Men are going to hit on her. Men are going to approach her. It's 11 p.m. in Brixton. I took her through some... Not the most... Not the nicest streets of London. And things can happen. As soon... We, we got out of the cinema, so at 11 p.m. We got out of the cinema. We walked for five... 50 steps to leave the cinema in the Ritzy in Brixton. 
we are 50 steps from the cinema and a really tall white dude just makes a beeline for her and stops in front of her like I'm not there. Um, at the time, she and I weren't dating yet. But he makes a beeline for her, stands in front of her like I'm not there. And I think he just says, you're very beautiful. He, he, he stands in front of her and stares at her like this and says, you're very beautiful. And he was clearly drunk and there were four guys with him behind him. And I mean, it's just a reality of, it's just the way it is. Really. If, if you didn't get the point I was trying to make is that shit happens and you want to be ready. You want to be early to work so that you don't have to stress so that nothing can, you know, you're going to be on time at the end of the day. And you also want to be able to fight so that God forbid the situation happens. You can de-escalate the situation and you're not thinking to yourself, oh, if I'm not able to calm this down with words, I can protect you know, the people I care about and myself and the person in front of me. Because as much as I'm talking about appreciating fighting and things of that nature, I never want to be in a street fight. Currently, I don't know how to fight, so that would be very bad for me. But... Usually people who do know how to fight don't put themselves in a situation where that can happen because they understand that. Once again, Andrew Tate says that as well in his own grandiose, almost narcissistic way. But not, not really. But he knows how to fight and he knows that if he finds himself in a street fight, the worst thing that could happen to him is that he hits the guy and kills him by accident. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand is that you don't want to get yourself in a street fight because no one wins. If you, quote-unquote, win the fight, you punch the guy in the face, he slips, hits his head on the floor, you're fucked. And if he beats you up, you're fucked. You, you'd be better off getting, you know, knocked out and waking up, you know, with a sore shoulder and a headache than you are knocking the guy out and he falls wrong and hits his head somewhere and you go to jail for a while. So there's no winning in that type of situation. And that, that's why you always told that. I remember when I went to the dojo learning of Yet Vodawa, they always told us, don't get into fights. You're learning to fight so that you won't have to. And that's just a principle of martial arts in general and the philosophy of it is that the point is not to be the toughest guy and to beat people up. It's, it's for what it does to you mentally and physically to actually get to know your body and to also know that if you find yourself in a situation where you can't run, you can protect yourself. And I'm going to segue. I don't, I don't think, I, I don't know if I had something more to say. But I'm going to segue into last year I got punched. I was taking pictures at night. It was around midnight in Victoria after work. I was drunk. And I took a photo of a guy with a flash. I mentioned this in a previous episode. But I have a scar here. Probably can't see it. When I got punched, my canine, I guess, the pointy tooth, went through my chin. So I got punched twice. And now I was drunk, and there were four guys. And you know, I don't know how things would have happened if I weren't drunk, or if I was a very experienced fighter. But to me, it was the best case scenario. Because after it happened, I just put my hands up, basically. I was quite a bit taller than all four of them. I put my hands up and I said, uh, I don't want to beef, I don't want to beef. I just said it quite loud to make it clear. And I do feel a bit bad about it in terms of, I do feel a bit cowardly. And that, that was my point. That, that's my point. I feel cowardly because I don't know how to fight. So it's not like I feel like I spared, how do I say this? To me, I would feel much better about the situation if when it happened, I knew how to fight, basically. Because to me, I imagine that if I did know how to fight when it happened, I would have reacted the same way. I would have said, you know, okay, you punched me. It was so funny when I got punched because I was a bit drunk and I had no idea I had gotten punched. I just, I just remember my head going like this. There was no pain in the, you know, I didn't feel any pain. I was a bit drunk. 
I, I mean, I suppose that that's a main factor. But also when there's adrenaline, I guess you don't really feel pain in the moment. I just remember my head going like this, back to my four, you know, aggressors. Once and then twice. I didn't see punches or anything. It was quite dark as well. And, and then I put my hands up. I started walking away saying, I don't want a beef. I don't want a beef. And oh, my back. And so I do believe that that was the best way to de-escalate the situation without anyone really getting hurt. I wouldn't say I got hurt. I mean, it, it was it looked pretty dramatic, but I just have this tiny scar here and no damage of any kind. So to me, the situation played out the best it could have based on the guy deciding to punch me, which was quite a ridiculous reaction. But once again, I do feel bad about it in terms of if at the moment I was I had been a person who knows how to fight and had decided to not act violently, I would have felt much better, if that makes sense. So once again, I don't want to know how to fight so that if that situation happens again, you know, I beat four people up and I look cool. I want to know how to fight so that if that happens again, and once again, I do, to me, the intelligent thing and just walk away. Yo. What do you want? Tu sais qu'il y a un signe sur la porte. Quoi? Il y a un signe sur la porte. Je l'ai même pas vu. C'est pas facile, c'est pas facile de voir. Quoi? Ouais, c'est pas facile de voir. Faudrait que tu le fasses en... En, en, en rouge, ouais. So yes, I want to have this ability so that if that happens again, I, I make the same decision, but knowing that if they decide to be even more immature on top of, you know, four against one punching a drunk guy, if they decide to escalate from that, I can protect myself. If that makes sense. So it's the same thing. It's about prevention. And so as a result of that, I bought the punching bag that's here. Because I felt like I had to, well, I need to feel more comfortable about the idea of a physical altercation. So I've been punching my punching bag for almost a, almost a year now. And I also realized that I haven't really taken pictures, I guess what you would call street photography, since the incident. And there was another incident in that same year, previous year, where I had been threatened to get killed by a guy in Stockwell. And then two other guys showed up. It was a bit scary. But that didn't really affect me. But even the punch, I didn't think, I didn't think it had affected me. But a few days ago, I made the reflect, myself the reflection that I haven't taken any pictures, street photos. And I would tell myself I didn't feel like it. But now I'm realizing it must be linked in a way to that incident. Now, taking pictures of people with a flash at midnight is a bad idea. And it's not something, well, it's something I would love to do, but I know realistically it's near impossible to do. I mean, I could go in the nice, nicer neighborhoods and do that, but I'm not interested in that. So it's not like I decided to stop fo taking photos because I only want to take photos of people in Victoria or in Brixton at midnight with a flash. But I, I stopped completely. And I'm realizing that it's probably linked to that in a way. A, res a residue of fear. Which is not good. And I guess it's a bit, it's like everything else, like working out. I just have to get back into do it again. Slowly but surely. But I'm quite disappointed in myself now, thinking about it, that it doesn't really matter how I feel anyways. I just should get back into it because I enjoy it very much. All right, so we talked about that. I thought I had a lot of notes, but maybe I was wrong. I mean, when you have a note that says, I'm a big enjoyer of walking as a means of transportation. Thank you, past self. You're useless. Yeah. I'm pretty much done. I'm pretty much done. But every time I'm pretty much done, I stop talking for a bit and then something else shows up, even though I'm planning on stopping. And it has. I've start, I've downloaded all my 
episodes. Because I, I upload them and then I delete them because they take a lot of space. I've downloaded them back from YouTube because I'm going to put them on Rumble because I'm anticipating that this... Obviously, it won't because... Most likely it won't because... Oh my god. Most likely this episode and the things I talked about... Because you're not supposed to talk about COVID or even that, or even conspiracy theories on YouTube, which is highly censored. So as a preventive measure, I've downloaded them back and I'm going to put them on Rumble. Yeah. It's scary. No, it's not really scary. Is it somewhat scary? I mean, since I don't have a following, you know, I'm pretty safe in terms of any repercussions right now. But I don't want them to all get deleted. You know, I like being able to look back at them. So I'm going to put them on Rumble, which is going to make everything more time consuming, maybe. But that's the plan. Wow, I thought something had showed up, but it's really just two seconds. But I don't mind just staying there, as I said before. Not saying anything. Life is good. I can't complain. My mother has had this obsession with me returning to university to do a master's. Which I don't even know if it's possible based on the grades I had. I actually have no idea what grades I had in at uni. You need a second, a 2-1 at least to do a master's. I don't think I got a second. But if I did, I might return to uni. Which would mean quitting my job. Which would be quite nice. I don't know. Based my previous experience with uni, I would pick my job over that. But if a master's is drastically different, that would be nice. I'm really going nowhere at the moment in terms of my creative career. I thought I would figure it out, but I have not. I am stuck in place. Which is annoying. Yeah, I don't really have anything else to say. I'm going to end it here. I really want to make a two hour long episode at some point. But I guess that is going to require preparation. Actually, part of the point of this was just seeing if I can talk for an hour. So I guess I, I should try to force myself to keep speaking. Even though I don't have anything to say. Oh, I watched a video on the making of the creator, the film The Creator, which was very interesting. They shot it on an FX3, which is around £3,000, I think, the price. Now, they don't talk about the... I haven't seen talks about the price of the lens, which was probably higher, much higher, I imagine. But it's cool to see they shot a film on a gimbal with... A, con a prosumer camera. It's, yeah. You don't really need much nowadays. I haven't, I was obsessed with this idea of making a movie a few months ago and I was writing it and ready to shoot it and I haven't done anything. And I'm starting to think that my plan was, after getting out of uni, was I'm going to make music videos. These are cheap and easy to make. For example, I don't need sound equipment. I don't need another person. I can shoot them by myself. I can edit them quickly. And I'm finding out that one, well, everything is more complicated than I, than I anticipated. Editing takes a whole lot longer than I expected. I'm not as fast as I thought I would be. It doesn't pay. It's even hard to find people who to make a video with. People are not really motivated. They flake on you. They are, they might they end up not releasing the video. Quite annoying. And so I'm thinking maybe the thing I should do is just give up on that, which is very time consuming, doesn't yield really any results, exposure, not even money, 
not much. Just give up all that stuff, which is, as I said, very time consuming and focus on doing what my dream is and making this movie, which won't bring any money at all. It will just be me spending money and most likely won't be seen by anyone. But it might be the way to go. I want to make a movie before I'm 25. Time is ticking. And I want to be a writer, director. I want to be a filmmaker. All I have to do is to make a film. And I know that it's possible. Even in the way I have plans, which would be as minimal as it gets. So maybe that's the way to almost cut bridges with the creatives that I've been working with because it's not going anywhere and try this thing that could go nowhere even more but would be fulfilling my dream to a degree of making movies. I'm hungry. I am hungry. All right, let's end this. Goodbye, good night, good morning, good afternoon. And if I don't see ya, good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Something like that. You know, Sean Strickland wasn't supposed to beat Adesanya. And Jukus Duplessis wasn't supposed to beat Robert Whittaker. And Sean O'Malley wasn't supposed to beat Aljamain Sterling. It's interesting how these things happen. Thank you.